Welcome. Uh, we have uh, registered 100 attendees, supposed to be. We have 116 registrants to the second webinar organized by ISA Incorporated in collaboration with Windrock International, the implementer of uh, Be Safe or Building Safe Agricultural Food Enterprises Project and the USDA. So today's webinar is on Philippine biosafety systems, organic agriculture and coexistence. I am Dr. Rodora Romero Albinida, Executive Director of ISA Incorporated, your moderator for today's webinar. This continuing acceptance of biota crops may be attributed to the Philippines implementation of a science-based approach on the regulation of biotechnology products. The Philippines continues to set the standard on the appropriate way of regulating the safe and responsible use of these techniques. Despite the reported benefits, there are still some biotech skeptics who spread misinformation on biotechnology that shape the perceptions of different stakeholders. Food and environmental safety, as well as compliance to organic agricultural practices, are some of the issues raised by non-adopting areas in the Philippines. Some farmers practice coexistence but are not confident of the outcome. Thus, today, our two experts will provide an overview of the Philippine biosafety systems and focus on how golden rice and BT eggplant were, went through the process of biosafety approval. They will also discuss the Philippine Organic Act and its implication in GM and the practice of coexistence. This webinar is part of a series of webinars on an array of topics about modern agricultural biotechnology applications and products in the Philippine context. The webinar will run for two hours. All microphones are on mute and questions should be entered in the Q&A function only. The chat functions will be used by the panelists and for important messages to the participants. All of the presentations and the Zoom recording will be posted at the ISA Inc. website, and they are freely downloadable uh, a few days after our webinar. We also invite you to stay till the end of the webinar and respond to a post webinar survey and respondents will be given certificates. So I don't wanna see these questions on the Q and A box. So to formally start the webinar, let me now introduce Mr. Ryan Bedford, the agricultural attache of USDA Foreign Agricultural Service in the Philippines. Mr. Bedford is the Deputy Officer at the Office of Agricultural Affairs in the Philippines. At FAS, he links U.S. agriculture to enhance export opportunities and global security. Among his previous assignments were as a Special Assistant in the Office of Foreign Service Operations, at the Office of Global Analysis for Beef and Cattle, and the Office of Trade Programs Division. Friends and colleagues, let us welcome Mr. Ryan Bedford, the Agate F. Shea of USDA FAS Manila, to give the opening message. Take the floor, Ryan. Okay, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. All right. Well, uh, hello everyone and good morning. I am Ryan Bedford, Agricultural Attaché of the United States Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agricultural Service at the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines. It is my great pleasure to welcome you today to a webinar on the Philippine Biosafety System, Organic Agriculture, and Coexistence, looking at the potential applications of biotech in the provinces of Bohol and Negros Occidental. This event was made possible thanks to the Be Safe Project, led by Doc Ramon Clarete and Isa, headed by Doc Aula Ademita. My office, the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service, is proud to sponsor Be Safe through our Food for Progress program, in which we selected Winrock International to implement a four-year project focusing on improving food safety systems in the Philippines, including as they pertain to biotechnology. The USDA is happy to be included in programs such as this to improve understanding of modern technologies and learn about potential applications of biotechnology to improve farmer prosperity, move toward more climate smart agriculture, and provide more tools for farmers to choose from. I'm pleased to understand that Mr. Marcos Dioso Jr. of the Office of the Whole Governor Aumentado will read a statement from the governor. We welcome the governor's perspective on this topic and encourage BSAFE and ISA to continue finding opportunities to work together with local government. 
as, as Ola mentioned, we will be hearing from experts in the field of biotech this morning with speakers including Ms. Malu Agbagala, Chairperson of the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines at the Department of Science and Technology, who will discuss managing the environmental and health risks of the Philippine biosafety system. She will explore the safety and nutritional benefits of some products, such as the recently approved Golden Rice and BT Eggplant. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Nina Halos, President of the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines, who will discuss organic farming and coexistence with genetic engineering. She will look to this in the context, context of GM technologies that can serve agriculture in the provinces of Bohol and Negros. Having been on a media call recently where I learned more about the GM technologies being pursued in Indonesia and Bangladesh, I can say that there indeed is strong potential here. And I look forward to Dr. Hollis' thoughts on this. Following, following the presentations, we'll have some short poll questions. Please look for them. And we'll also have time for questions and answers, which will be an excellent opportunity to ask any questions you may have to our esteemed experts, be it on today's topic of organic GM coexistence, or more broadly on GM crops, the latest technologies such as genome editing or CRISPR, or whatever else may be of interest to you in this emerging field of ag science. Here at USDA Manila, we closely follow developments of Philippine biotechnology. And over my four years here in, in Manila, we've noted our, in our public gain reports that the Philippines is a regional leader in biotechnology. The Philippines was an early adopter in growing BT corn, which provides protection from pests and helps reduce the need for inputs. And the Philippines more recently has approved the commercial propagation of golden rice, becoming the first country in the world to do so. We look forward to hearing more from our speakers on its potential. The country has also approved BT eggplant for direct use, following Bangladesh and approving this climate smart technology for this economically important crop. Now, of course, all the best science in the world does not help, however, without the evidence and risk-based regulations to facilitate their development, to ensure they are adequately assessed for safety and provide a pathway to commercialization. In this respect, the Philippines has moved forward with streamlining its regulatory framework, known as the Revised Joint Department Circular, and established a policy for evaluating genome-edited plants, known as plant breeding innovations. Together with the JDC, this will provide farmers with a fuller set of tools to help manage a myriad challenges they face. These developments are all the more important as we face the daunting challenges of climate change and a warming planet. At the pre-summit of the United Nations Food Systems Summit, the United States launched the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, known as aim for c with the goal of increasing and accelerating global innovation research and development on agriculture and food systems in support of climate action. I'm happy to note that the Philippines joined the United States and many other countries in this effort, which will include input use efficiency, resilient crop and livestock production, enhanced digital tools, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable food systems, and sustainable productivity improvements. Across our government agencies and beyond, the United States has been a friend, partner, and ally to the Philippines, including the agricultural research community, and we look forward to continuing this partnership. So thank you very much for joining us for this virtual seminar. I would like to also thank the organizers of the webinar, Dark Ola and Doc Clarete, for the hard work, as well as our speakers, Ms. Agbagala, Doc Halos, to Doc Romero Alamita for his support, and to Dr. Claro Mingala of the DA Biotech Program Office, who will provide closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks again for joining, and good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, a brief overview of what we're going to have today. And also, uh, Ryan also has introduced our speakers. Very well done. Thank you so much. So I would, I, I was, as I was looking at the participants, um, I see that we have representatives or uh, participants from different countries. I see our friends from Thailand, from Japan, and uh, India. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have other participants from other countries. We also would like to recognize the presence of our participants from the provinces of Bahol and Negros. And I see some farmers. Uh, Edwin Panaluman also is present with us. And so to continue our um, webinar, we have Mr. Marcos um, Vioso Jr. from the Office of the Governor of Aris Aumentado to give us some messages because he's not able to come. So uh, Mr. Marcos Vioso Jr. is his representative. Let's welcome Mr. Joso, please. Uh, magandang umaga po. Good morning at ma maayong buntag kanatong tanan mga pulanon, mga bisaya, maayong buntag kanatong tanan. And uh, kasubo na mo na uh, hindi makaten si Governor elect aumentado because of his busy schedule. So I'm going to read the message of the good uh, governor uh, for this event. Power team speakers, uh, Ms. Loriray uh, Agbagala, Assistant Scientist DOST, Dr. Saturnina Halos, 
President, Chair, Board of Directors, Biotech Coalition of the Philippines, Dr. Rodora Romero Aldimita, Executive Director, International Service for Acquisition of Ag Agri Biotech Applications Incorporated, guest, and also to Mr. Ryan Belport, U.S. Attaché of Agriculture. Uh, good morning. The honor and pleasure is mine to greet everyone a pleasant morning. Today, we are fortunate to be invited to take part in one of the initiatives by the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Application in the collaboration with BSAFE in helping provide information on the Philippine Biosafety Systems, Organic Agriculture, and Practice of Coexistence. As you may know, Biotechnology is a science that allows our farmers to be more efficient and environmentally conscious by growing more crops resistant to pest diseases on less land. Some of the most prevalent benefits of biotechnology in agriculture include increase in crop production, better crop protection, increase in nutrition value, pressure, pro pressure produced, and better taste, chemical tolerance, and disease resistance. The Philippines continues to be leader, to be a leader of biotechnology in Southeast Asia. It was the first in the region to have regulatory framework on genomic editing crops. The first in Asia to approve cultivation of G crop, food, and feed, and the first in the world to approve golden rice for cultivation. Golden rice and uh, bitty corn are currently the crops that are allowed for commercial propagation in the Philippines. At present, we are reaping the benefits of biotechnology. Ever since the Philippines adopted biotech corn for cultivation, food, feed, and processing, the benefits that accord to the farmers mounted to 872.6 million dollars from 2003 to 2018. Since its introduction, <clears throat> G corn planted area has grown from 10,769 hectares in 2003 to nearly 677,544 hectares in 2020. The use of G corn combats the fall of army worm pest, which the Department of Agriculture said had already destroyed about 11,000 hectares of corn farms in 57 provinces. The following is approval for FFP. In December 2019, Golden Rice has been granted a biosafety permit for commercial propagation by the Department of Agriculture Bureau of Plant Industry. Golden Rice tends to competent existing interventions to address vitamin A deficiency, a serious public health problem affecting 250 million people worldwide. Primarily children and pregnant women, it contains beta carotene, vitamin A, and plant pigment that body converts into vitamin A as needed. With a lesser cost of pesticides and labor and increase in production, Filipino farmers are projected to gain a net increase benefit of around 50,000 per hectare by planting BT eggplant compared to the current eggplant variety. The Philippines continues to set the standard on appropriate way of regulating safe, responsible use of these technologies. All the stakeholders are equally dedicated in the implementation a science-based approach on the regulation of biotechnology products in furtherance of the acceptance or at least a better perception of biotech crops by the general public. <clears throat> Despite these continuous efforts, however, more work needs to be done to eradicate disinformation on biotechnology that shape the perceptions of different stakeholders. We are aware of some of the issues raised by non-adapting areas in the Philippines like my province. That's why I am inviting you to showcase biotech here that the people and its leaders can decide the good benefits in it. On that note, we are hopeful that 
this webinar will be very helpful in providing information on the Philippine biosafety systems, organic agriculture, and practice of coexistence aids in providing an overview of Philippine biosafety systems, how golden rice and bt egg plant went through the process of biosafety approval, as well as comprehensive discussion of the Philippine Organic Act and its implication of GM and practice of coexistence. Daghang salamat o maayong buntag. Good morning to everyone. Thank you so much, sir. It's so enlightening that Governor Mentado and the province of Bohol understands what biotechnology is from the message that he gave to us. And we are accepting the challenge. We would like to go to Bohol and showcase what biotechnology can provide to, to the farmers in the province. Thank you so much, sir. I hope you can stay so that yeah. you can listen to all the talks. Thank you, Paul. Thank okay, you. now we can move forward and I think uh, our speaker is ready. So our first speaker is Ms. Malu Agbagala, Assistant Scientist and Head Secretariat of the National Committee on Biosafety and DOST Biosafety Committee. She is a member of the technical working group and committees involved in developing the Joint Department Circular Number no. 1 Series of 2016, the regulatory framework of GM animals, and the guidance document on GM fish. She, she was also a member of the expert working group of the International Plant, Plant Protection Convention tasked to draft the guidance on pest risk assessment, uh, pest risk management as a new international standard for phytosanitary measures, or ISPM. She was formerly affiliated with the Bureau of Plant Industry and was one of my frequent visitors at Phil Rice when I was still a scientist back then. <laughs> she obtained her bachelor's and master's degree on plant pathology at UPLB. Friends and colleagues, let's welcome Ms. Malu Agbagala. Take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Mom Ola, for the very kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga po sa lahat. Uh, before I proceed with my presentation, let me thank first the organizer for the opportunity to be with you today. So let me just uh, share my presentation. Okay. Okay. So... Um, so as you can see on the screen, uh, I will be talking on, the man on managing environmental and health risks, the Philippine biosafety system with focus on the safety and nutritional benefits of golden rice and beet it along. So this is the outline of my presentation. Okay, so uh, GMOs has been the buzzword since the 80s and the 90s. And I remember the Philippines approved its first GM crop, which is Viticorn, in 1999, and its commercialization in, 2000, in 2002. And don't be surprised if I tell you that most of the food that we are eating today contains GM material, like for example, in the oil that was used in cooking your favorite French fries, and uh, the dough that was used uh, in making the bun for your McBurger, the ketchup that you use, and your Skippy peanut butter. And during the early introduction of GMOs, the questions would always be, are GMOs safe? So how do we ensure that GMOs are safe for use and consumption, including safety to the environment? Well, for years, there have been hundreds of studies globally to prove the safety of GM crops and its products. And the safety of GMOs has been affirmed by agricultural and food safety regulatory agencies around the world, including our country's regulatory agencies, which had rigorously assessed the food and feed and environmental safety of GM foods. So it is worth it to note that the Philippine regulatory system has been in place for 31 years, ensuring that products supported by technology are safe to humans, animals, and the environment. And recognizing the importance of modern biotechnology, the Philippines established its biosafety regulatory system in 1990 through the signing of EO number 430, creating the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines which will later repla replace with EO number 514 in 2006, establishing the National Biosafety Framework and further strengthening the NCBP. 
it in effect expands the scope covered by EO430, which included other government agencies and non-government groups, which are also stakeholders in biotechnology R&D activities and their products. So the NCBP under EO514 performs biosafety policy, accountability, scientific and capacity building functions. It also defines the roles of the different government departments and agencies in relation to biotechnology and biosafety. Then we have the Joint Department Circular Number 1, which governs the rules and regulations for the research and development, handling and use, transboundary movement, release into the environment and management of genetically modified plant and plant products derived from the use of modern biotech. So this slide shows the different departments and agencies involved in the regulation and risk assessment of GM plants and its products. We have the Department of Agriculture, which leads in the, which takes the lead in the evaluation and monitoring of articles or GM articles for, fit, for trial, commercial propagation, and for direct use. The Department of Science and Technology, which takes the lead in evaluating and monitoring contained use of GMOs. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources, which ensures that the applicable environmental assessments are undertaken and potential impacts are identified. The Department of Health, which formulates guidelines and review results of assessing health impacts posed by modern biotechnology. And the Department of Interior and Local Government, which supervises the public consultation for field trials. So to ensure that genetically engineered plants are adequately evaluated prior to extensive planting, a regulation requires the step-by-step -step introduction of the plant into the environment. That is, the transgenic plant is introduced gradually into the open environment, first by testing this in confined conditions, but then by testing in field plots, and finally into commercial scale planting. And in each testing step prior to commercialization, this assessment is undertaken. So these are also the same activities that need regulatory approvals. For contained and confined tests, this would be under the responsibility of the DOS Biosafety Committee, while the multi-location field trial, commercial propagation, and direct use are under the purview of the Department of Agriculture Bureau of Plant Industry. So for contained use, the contained use is the first stage of GMO development where experiments are conducted inside the physical structure, like for example, laboratory and greenhouse, with controlled specific measures that limit the contact of the GMO with its external environment. So why is it important to perform love and greenhouse trials? So the trait developer must identify plants that meet the product specifications. In addition to trait efficacy, product specifications include that the trait is fertile, that the trait is inherited, that plant performance and appearance are not affected, and any other parameters that may be specific for the trait of interest. For, the, for, for field trials, we have a policy that no regulated articles shall be released into the environment for field trial unless a biosafety permit for field trial has been secured in accordance with the circular. For a, a field trial is done to assess the crop's agronomic performance. This enables the project proponents to generate sufficient data that will determine the varieties which will be most likely placed in the market. And during field trials, the plants are evaluated for trait efficacy, trait stability, and agronomic observation in field conditions at multiple geographic locations and over multiple growing seasons. Agronomic performance uh, data are collected and trait stability is examined across different plant generations to ensure the desirable trait efficacy for a product. And the plants with stable and desirable trait efficacy and favorable agronomic differences or characteristics is carried on for further evaluation. And remember that the main focus of risk assessment during field trials are the measures to prevent unintended dispersal of seeds and plants, measures to prevent unintended pollen flow, and measures to prevent a crop from persisting or receding after the trial is completed, and the effect to environment or the non-target organisms. And those measures are carried out to attain the objectives like preventing the geogenes from, from escaping the, the trial site, preventing the GM plant material from being consumed by humans or, or other or livestock, and preventing the GM materials or animals from escaping or establishing and persisting in the environment. So after the successful multi-location field trials, the next stage is the commercial propagation. 
And the concern is to make sure that the GM crop was safe to use as food or feed and that it did not pose a risk to people, animals, and the environment. For commercial propagation, the intent of the safety assessment is to identify new or altered environmental or nutritional impacts and characteristics relative to the parental conventional counterpart. And specifically to address environmental issues, the possibility of gene flow is assessed, the plant's potential for weediness or invasiveness, the potential to transfer to other species, effects on biodiversity, and impact on non-target organisms. For direct use, the safety assessment is conducted to provide assurance using the best available scientific knowledge that these products are as safe to consume as their conventional counterpart and therefore do not cause appreciable harm when prepared, used, and are eaten according to their intended use. So what are the concerns during the assessment process? For food and feed safety, GM crops are assessed with, as, with respect to their potential toxicity, potential to cause an allergic response, and possible unintended effects that may result from the insertion of the new genes into the host plants. And according to the Codex Guideline for Food Safety Assessment, the approach is based on the principle that the safety of foods derived from GM plants should be evaluated relative to the conventional counterpart that is the history of safe use. And the assessment takes into account both intended and unintended effects of the introduced modifications. A variety of data and information are necessary because no one test can detect all possible unintended effects or identify those relevant to food and food safety. The agronomic and phenotypic data collected by plant breeders provide the initial screen for selecting events for commercialization. And those that pass this initial screen are then moved into the food and food safety assessment process where various methods are utilized to further identify and detect any unintended effects. So the Philippines recognizes that genetic engineering has the potential to help increase production and productivity in agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. However, we are also aware of the concern about the potential risk posed by certain aspects of modern biotechnology, and these concerns around the potential effects on human and animal health and the environmental consequences. So having said that, the Philippines supports a science-based evaluation system that to determine the benefits and risks of each individual GMO. We apply a case-by-case -case approach to address the concerns regarding the biosafety of each product or process prior to its release. And the possible effects on biodiversity, the environment, and food safety are being evaluated and the extent to which the benefits of the product or process at which its risk are also being assessed. So the risk assessment of GMOs in the country is largely based on the concept of substantial equivalence also taking into consideration familiarity with the crop, history of safe use, and previous exposure. The GM crop is compared with its non-GM counterpart, taking into account the comparative nutritive value, presence of allergens and levels of anti-nutrients and toxins, pests and wilderness potential, environmental implications, and options for risk management. If the non-GM counterpart has a history of safe use and acceptable level of safety, the risk assessment focuses on the defined difference. And without aiming to establish absolute safety, the risk assessment seeks to determine safety in the context of the traditional use of the non-GM counterpart. So most regulatory packages being submitted to regulatory agencies contain information on the conventional crop, the description of the nutrigenic crop, and molecular characterization, food and feed composition, and agronomic composition or equivalence. So how are GM crops assessed for environmental safety? So initially, the location and description of the field trial sites are assessed, including the risk exposure, and requires the proponent or the applicant to provide an environmental management plan or mitigating measures for risk management. Most countries, including the Philippines, use similar risk assessment procedures in considering the interactions between a GM crop and its environment. And what are being addressed are specific questions about unintentional effects such as impact on non-target organisms in the environment, whether the modified crop might persist in the environment longer than usual or invade new habitats, and likelihood and consequences of a gene being transferred unintentionally from the modified crop to other species. A specific risk areas are identified which include gene flow or transfer of inserted gene to other varieties or to wild relatives and readiness, persistence, or invasiveness of the GMO. 
impact on biodiversity and effects on non-target organisms are also being evaluated, taking into consideration the receiving environment, native flora and fauna, the agricultural crops and farm animals, and non-target organisms which provide valuable ecosystem functions which might be affected. For food and food safety assessment, the Joint Department Circular has established a rigorous and transparent process for assessing the safety of GM foods. The safety assessment is undertaken in accordance with internationally established scientific principles and guidelines developed through the work of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and the Codex Alimentarius Commission. So to date, the safety assessment of foods derived from recombinant DNA plants has been based on the principle that these products can be compared with conventional counterparts that have an established history of safe use. The objective is to determine if the food presents any new or altered hazard in comparison with its conventional counterpart. And the goal is not to establish an absolute level of safety, but the food should be as safe as its conventional counterpart in the sense that there is a reasonable certainty that no harm will result from its intended use under the anticipated conditions of processing and consumption. So early on in the regulation, it is quite clear that socioeconomic, cultural, and ethical considerations are separate and distinct from risk assessment, and that by safety determination is strictly science-based. The Philippine socioeconomic uh, considerations assessment process started with a simplistic interpretation of the country's national goals on food security and alleviation of poverty. Hence, in our socioeconomic consideration assessment, the quantifiable indicators that reflected the national development goals were productivity, cost efficiency, net farm income, trade, and global competitiveness. Now let's take a look at Golden Rice to illustrate further how it undergone regulatory scrutiny by the regulatory agencies. So Golden Rice was developed by the Department of Agriculture, Philippine Rice Research Institute in partnership with the International Rice Research Institute to contain additional levels of beta carotene, which the body converts into vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiency is a serious public health problem affecting millions of children and pregnant women globally. So Golden Rice is genetically engineered to provide 30 to 50% of the estimated average requirement for vitamin A of young children the age group most susceptible to VAD or uh, vitamin A deficiency in the Philippines. And this new variety has already received food safety approvals from regulators in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States, but the Philippines is the first country to approve its commercial cultivation. So Golden Rice was supplied and approved for contained experiment in 2005 at the DOST by Safety Committee. And after thorough evaluation, the committee found that the transgenic plant will have no adverse effect on the environment during its entire period of experiments. Then it went on to confine tests in three different locations, field rice near by Siha, field rice Batak, and field rice Isabella, primarily to produce sufficient seeds to be used for compositional analysis and other biosafety tests. And we don't just approve GM crop for specific use. The regulatory agencies impose some conditions for its approval, like for example, isolation distance, and that all biosafety measures should be in place at the beginning of the trial. So what you see is a sample data on agronomic performance, which were collected, which includes grain yield and grain quality attributes. The multiplication trial was applied under the Bureau of Plant Industry after satisfactory completion of the contained and confined experiments. And field trial experiments or assessment covers the crop's history of safe use, the characteristics of the host plant, characterization and safety assessment of the GM product, the proposed trial site, environmental risk assessment, environmental health risk assessment, and the socioeconomic, ethical, and cultural concerns uh, done by the socioeconomic expert. <clears throat> so Golden Rice was uh, applied for food and feed and for processing on February 28, 2017, and was given approval in 2019. What you see on your screen are the dossiers or the documents submitted for evaluation. And these are the history of use or of host and donor organism, description of the genetic modification, key nutrients and anti-nutrients, safety of proteins produced, information on allergenicity, and compositional analysis, among others. 
And for food and feed, and, and feed composition, they look at the fatty acid and amino acid composition, composition of vitamins, carotenoids, and anti-nutrients in grains, and proximate fibers and minerals also in grains. And these were all compared with the conventional rice, and the assessors found no significant difference between the golden rice and its counterpart. Moving on to its commercial propagation, uh, it got its approval last July of 2021. And some of the safety considerations that we're looking to were the general description, including taxonomy and morphology, centers of origin, geographical distribution and agronomic practices, reproductive biology, the, its genetics, hybridization and introgression, and various interactions with other organisms. And these are also uh, the by safety permit approvals that were given for its commercial uh, propagation. Now let's move on to uh, uh, the BT egg plant regulatory approval. With the success in the adoption of biotech in the, in the country, the Institute of uh, uh, Plant Breeding at the University of the Philippines Los Baños spearheaded the development of a biotech eggplant that provides resistance to its chronic pests, the fruit and shoot borer. The eggplant fruit and shoot borer is a lepilop lepiloptorous insect whose larva consumes the inner part of the eggplant fruit. And damage caused by the, by the borer normally results to nearly 80% of yield loss, especially during high incidence of its infestation. So this is the timeline of the eggplant development. The research started in 2003 in the laboratory and conducted experiment from 2004 to 2009 under the supervision of the DOS by Safety Committee. Field trials in Laguna, Pangasinan, Camarina Sur, and North Cotabato were conducted from 2010 to 2012. Then they obtained the biosafety permit in 2021 for, for food and feed in 2021, and their target completion for commercial propagation approvals is 2022. And as with other biotech crops developed in the Philippines and elsewhere, BT Talong followed a rigorous regulatory re guidelines and review throughout its research and development process. The contained lab and screenhouse tests were done under contained facilities in IPB under the monitoring of the DOST by Safety Committee. And the contained trial aims to develop advanced lines of BT eggplant with the desired fruit rates and assess the efficacy of BT eggplant against the larva. The confined field trial aims to assess the field efficacy, determine the stability of the transgene, and to assess the effect on non target organisms. For the multi location trial, uh, they were conducted in Santa Maria Pangasinan, UP Los Baños, Central Bicol State University, Cabarina Sur, and the University of Southern Mindanao, Cabacan, North Cotabato. And for multi location field trial, some type of safety assessment studies that were conducted were bioefficacy study and horticultural performance and environmental safety studies. And these were some of the conditions that uh, were imposed. Uh, in order for, for BT eggplant to conduct its, uh, its field trials. These are the conditions to prevent pollen flow or seed dissemination, conditions to prevent persistence in the environment, and these are the conditions to prevent introduction into the food and feed pathways. <clears throat> and these are the, and so these are the, uh, the, 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 uh, the BT eggplant also uh, has its application for food and feed safety uh, approved in, in 2021. And the food and feed uh, uh, by safety permit is valid for five years and does not allow yet the field planting of bit egg plant. So the application for food and feed was uh, rigorously assessed by the interagency experts following the regulatory procedures of the Joint Department Circular. And uh, this is the last stage of the regulatory process that allows the commercial propagation or the commercial cultivation of BT eggplant. The application for commercial propagation was already submitted to the DI uh, Biotechnology Unit uh, last March 30 of 2022. It was already, the application was already assessed and evaluated by the Joint Assessment Group uh, in May of 2022. And simultaneous with the application of B at BPI, the, regist the registration of BT eggplant as a PIP and UPLD as license holder of BT eggplant was also undertaken under the, uh, the Fertilizer and Pesticide Authority. So I think this is my last slide, but let me finish with the statement that was released by the Laureate's letter supporting precision agriculture. 
So it says scientific and regulatory agencies around the world have repeatedly and consistently found crops and foods improved through biotechnology to be as safe, to be as safe as, if not safer than those derived from any other method of production. Opposition based on emotion and dogma contradicted by data must be stopped. Okay, so thank you very much for your interest and for your attention. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, Ms. Malu Agbagala. Malu has been there in, the, in our regulatory uh, system in, from, the, from the beginning up to now. And she, as I said a while ago, she has been there in um, putting together a lot of the regulations. And so this presentation provided us an overview of uh, what our regulators with our scientists have put together so that GM crops and other products of modern biotechnology can come to us, to our country for our benefit. So thank you so much, Ms. Malu. Now let's proceed with uh, the poll questions. Uh, I'd like to call on, uh, yeah, okay. So these are the poll questions for Ms. Malu. You can start with number one. There are four questions. And so I'll give you a minute. So NCBP is the lead body that coordinates and harmonizes interagency and multi-sector efforts in developing biosafety policies in the country. The second is DA is the lead agency responsible in the conduct of public consultation related to biotech products. In, this, in the safety assessment of biotech products for food and feed juice, changes in composition and nutritional value is being considered. And last is socioeconomic considerations in decision-making on GMOs is a mandatory requirement under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. So please vote now and let's see the, the poll response in a little while. Laura, can you show, or EJ, can you show the, the results as it comes? In the meantime, may I invite you to put your questions in the Q&A function. Questions for Ms. Malu Agbagala will be raised in, uh, later after the presentation of Dr. Hollis. Okay, do we have the response now? There you go. Yeah, so true, 100% for the first question. Okay, true for uh, number two. Number three, so we have 94% also said true. Okay, and I think all of these are correct. So thank you very much, our participants for responding to the poll questions. And it looks like you really listened to the presentations. So thank you so much again, Ms. Malu Agbagala. Now let's proceed to our next speaker. Dr. Saturne Nahalos is the president and chair of the board of directors of, of the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines. She has served as consultant in capacity building in biotech regulations and currently chairs various techni technical advisory committees under the Department of Agriculture. These include the Committee on Applied Research under the Biotech Program Office, the Climate Resilient Office, and the Technical Advisory Group on Modern Biotechnology and Innovation. She has helped craft various biosafety policies of the Philippines, including EO514 series of 2006, the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act of 1997, the Organic Agriculture Act of 2010, that's why we invited her, and the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Law of 2013, among many others. She holds a PhD, PhD in genetics from UC Berkeley, USA, she established the first functional forensic DNA laboratory in the country 
And she's a former professor in molecular biology and biotechnology at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and has held various academic and scientific positions in oh, other wow. institutions. Let us welcome Dr. Nina Halos, as we fondly call her, my favorite speaker in many, many <laughs> aspects. <laughs> you have the floor, ma'am. Thank you, Ola. Oh, that's long. <laughs> Baka mas mahaba pa yung introduction kaysa yung presentation ko. Yeah, before I proceed with my uh, presentation, I would like to to thank, you know, Governor, Governor Argumentado. That's very inspiring because the Department of Agriculture is supporting a large agroforestry project in Bohol and their main crop is corn. And uh, given the data that we have been obtaining from different GM corn farmers in the country, these farmers from Bohol would benefit from planting GM corn. But uh, as of now, presently, they have a, an ordinance against uh, planting GM corn. So I hope uh, Governor Aumentado will have that reviewed and see uh, whether you know, it is timely already to allow our, far our farmers in Bohol to plant GM corn because, you know, uh, planters of GM corn, about 86% of them have, you know, have, uh, in have improved their lives actually. And you can also come up and, and you can also say that most of them has uh, moved out of poverty. So, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so I was assigned this topic about organic farming and coexistence with GMOs, as well as the application of GM technologies in the provinces of Bohol and Negros Occidental. Um, slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, slideshow. Okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so I'll I'll talk about organic agriculture policies, GM crop policies, which is very much explained already by, by uh, Ms. Malu, GM crops for Philippine agriculture, and what is coexistence of organic agri agriculture and GMOs. Okay, if you look at, there are two laws uh, concerning organic agriculture. The first one is 168, RA 168. This is the basic law on agri organic agriculture. And then uh, there were amendments made for on this law, and that's in RA 11.5.11. So I'll just uh, point the salient features of this. Of course, in 168, organic agriculture is uh, defined as all agricultural systems that promote economic, um, ecologically sound, socially acceptable, economically viable, and technically feasible production of food and fibers. So it's it's very, very general actually, but if you look at the uh, details of this uh, definition, it talks about uh, drastically reducing external inputs, refraining from using chemical fertilizers, pesticides and pharmaceuticals. Actually, this is the, it, it appears to be the main feature actually of organic farming, you know, and then um, it talks about uh, what are the other things that you can do, you know, and uh, it also mentions here the use of biotechnology, except that, again, the main feature here of this uh, uh, lengthy definition is that uh, GMOs are not allowed in organic agriculture or genetically modified organisms. Uh, there are the, the significant amendment to, to RA 168, actually one is on certification. It talks about two types of certification, the participatory guarantee system, which is a locally focused quality assurance system developed and practiced by people engaged in organic farming. Actually, nangyayari nito is within a community, sila sila lang nagsas nagsasabi no, that they're following the organic uh, agriculture standards because uh, the certification process now requires, uh, requires uh, compliance to a, a national standard. The other type of, cert of uh, certification is third-party certification, which was what was in 
uh, 168, RA or uh, 168. And uh, so you need a different party to certify that you are following organic agriculture standards. And uh, that was quite uh, expensive for many and uh, a little bit uh, tedious. So we do have a Philippine national standards for organic agriculture. So in this particular, you, have, you can get this uh, document from the uh, Bureau of Agriculture and Fisheries uh, Product Standards. So it has minimum standards for conversion, meaning that you know, if you're not practicing organic agriculture, you have to have two years uh, to refrain from using all these inputs that are not uh, allowed. So you let your, your, your production system actually within that period will uh, probably fall because uh, you know, uh, you're used to using uh, these uh, other inputs, okay? And then it has minimum standards for crop production, animal production, beekeeping, processing, special products, labeling and consumer information, traceability, and also requirements for the inclusion of substances for organic production. So it's uh, it's very very actually it's uh, you know very well defined. So you have to follow all these standards. The thing also is that this has to be followed by each farmer that would like to have his product certified as organic. And this is one of the issues that has been raised by many farmers actually. On the other hand, as uh, Ms. Agbagala has explained, GMOs or genetically modified organisms are regulated under EO514 series of 2006. And uh, it has a definition saying that it also refers to the living modified organism under the international guideline, which is the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And it refers to any living orga organism that uh, acquired a new combination of genetic materials obtained through the use of modern biotechnology. And also the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety has defined modern bi biotechnology as the application of in vitro nucleic acid techniques. That is, this is all a laboratory methodology, okay? So you have the in vitro nucleic acid techniques, you do that in the laboratory, fusion of cells. Again, you do that under the laborato uh, under lab laboratory conditions, which are very, very sterile. And gem crops are regulated as explained by uh, Ms. Agbagala by JDC1 series of 2022 this year. It is uh, the regulation is based on food and environmental safety assessments, okay? And uh, the safety assessments conform with the standards set by international bodies like Codex Alimentarius, OECD, Cart Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. So if you look at the, this type of farming systems, you know, if in organic agriculture, the production system itself is regulated. And the regulation is at farm level. So small farmers, you know, it's of, it's of them who wants to have their uh, product certified. They have to go through, through the certification process. On the other hand, GMOs are regulated by product, specific product, okay? And once it is approved by our uh, regulatory uh, bodies, it can be planted where the crop is allowed or used to be planted. Okay, so the farmers do not worry about regulation. Again, let me just repeat that in organic agriculture, the farmers uh, would worry about regulation. But in GMOs, it is the maker of the technology, the developer of the GMO itself, that will worry about following the regulation. Okay, and farmers do not need to worry about that. Once it is approved, they can go ahead and plant it. Okay, and in organic agriculture, they, these are regulated to ensure production standards are met, you know, following the standard set, national standard set for organic agriculture. On the other hand, GM crops are regulated to ensure food and environmental safety of this specific product. And, you know, what does, uh, there's, there are implications here. 
for example, in the US, they, when the product, you know, something is wrong with the product, they would recall the product from the market. Most of the recalls or all of the recalls of organic foods in the US is due to deaths and illnesses because of bacterial contamination. On the other hand, the recall of biotech crops in the US is due to non-compliance to regulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, it has nothing to do at all with safety. Unlike the recall of organic foods, this is about safety. The other thing that you're going to learn about uh, you know, the differences between uh, gem crop uh, farming and organic agriculture is that the rates of adoption is uh, different. It's very high for organic uh, for gem crop farming. It is uh, one of the um, highest rate of adoption by farmers in the history of agriculture. But the adoption is limited to uh, a number of countries only because of the regulatory regulatory requirement. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'm sorry, this is a 2017 data. You, you have 24 countries adopting, uh, planting GM crop. I think today it's about 28, 29. For organic agriculture, there are 181 countries. But if you look at the hectare that is planted or, or area planted to this, you have a very uh, big difference. You have a greater area planted to GM crops compared with organic uh, crop farming, which is only, you know, 189 versus 70 million hectares. And then uh, there are more uh, farmers uh, plant, uh, planting or, uh, GM crop, 17 million versus 2.9 million organic producers. Um, well, the other big difference there is that there is uh, intellectual property protection for uh, GM crops, and you cannot find this in organic agriculture. <laughs> And there are fewer crops that are planted in GM crop farming, only 17 as of 2017. I think there should be about 30 now because there were uh, new approvals. 2017, you have GM sugarcane, for example, that was approved. Now we have GM uh, BT talong and of course, uh, uh, golden rice. So that would be about 20 that has been approved for GM crop farming. And uh, well, in organic agriculture, yeah, you know, any crop will do. So that, as, that is as many as many as there are crops in agriculture. And the mode of uh, spread of technology, it is actually promoted, the GM crop farming is promoted by large multinational corporations that are, there are about four now worldwide, but uh, usually it is also promoted by farmer to farmer um, exchanges. In organic agriculture, this is promoted by individuals, small groups, and uh, it is also supported by consumers with similar uh, philosophies, NGOs, and the government promotes uh, organic agriculture. If you look at uh, our experience, actually, we have been spending, the Philippine government has been spending uh, for the first, I think, for the first five years after the act, it has been spending almost 1 billion per year, but the adoption is, is still very low. Okay, so GM corn, uh, GMOs in the Philippines. Uh, what is being planted right now is GM corn. It is insect resistant. It is herbicide tolerant. And uh, depending upon the year, it could be from 500,000 to 800,000 hectares per year and the yields would range from four to 17 tons per hectare. The 17 tons happened, I don't know, but I, I got a report only once, so I don't know if it was repeated, uh, but that was really amazing to be able to get 17 tons per hectare. But the average is about seven tons per uh, in the whole country. And uh, I have here the, the data that I, I obtained from BPI that, uh, uh, from 2020, uh, the year 2021 to 2020 to 2021, we have 500, about more than 500,000 hectares. In the year uh, 2019 to 2020, it's about, it's more than 800,000. Okay. And then GM rice has been approved. It is, uh, it, uh, field rice has a 
has a deployment plan for uh, GM rice. It has pro-vitamin A in the grain. And then we import a lot of GM soybean and uh, we use it for feeds and food. And then the, we also import enzyme that is used in food, which is produced by GM microbes. Now, genetically modified uh, sugarcane is already approved for pl planting, for commercial planting in Brazil. What they have there is Stembora resistant sugarcane. In Indonesia, this was earlier approved and they have drought tolerant sugarcane. Uh, it's at, up, to the, up to this year, the report is that it is still in pilot scale. There are other traits being transferred to sugarcane. We have disease resistance. So you have different projects on virus resistant sugarcane, bacterial resistant sugarcane, fungal resistant sugarcane. And of course, there's also herbicide tolerance, uh, which is a big problem. Actually, you know, too, too much weed will not uh, give you as much yield as when uh, you have weed food uh, production. And then there are industrial traits that are uh, to sugarcane, like trait to increase saccharif saccharification efficiency, like uh, modifying the lignin of sugarcane so that you can uh, you can extract more sugar from the uh, from the stem, and then uh, it, the sugar is being used for bio the production of bioplastics. Uh, it is also also used for the production of uh, the trend today. Actually, is for agriculture uh, agricultural products and agricultural waste and byproducts to be used in. Uh, or industrial materials that are currently being uh, produced from biofuels. I'm not biofuels. Our dependence on petroleum-based products. And also, like for example, bioplastics, so you can have biodegradable plastic. It is one of our, you know, one of the big problems in the Philippines that we are number one in, uh, in throwing plastics into the, our oceans. So we have to... Now, the target for organic agricultural conversion by the Department of Agriculture, you know, it's, uh, it's a more realistic figure of 5% of agricultural area. So our hectares is only about 2,000 hectares of area okay and these are very small areas uh, you have one hectare half a hectare the bigger ones are converted into agritourism uh, areas you know and uh, and because of there are some challenges to the adoption of organic farming certification which is addressed by RA11511 the problem here about the uh, um, the participatory guarantee system is only recognized locally. It is not, it can, if you want to export your organic product, you have to go through the third party certification of uh, the land, the system from uh, traditional to or conventional to organic, uh, you, you need at least two years. And because the, because the production is going to, to fall, then uh, you're going to incur loss, loss in income. And then, as like I said earlier, farm level certification. You know, our small, they, they sometimes they even would not like to follow, you know, the, the technology that we are promoting. So for them, this is too much work, actually. And uh, really get lower yields with uh, organic farming. And therefore you need to have niche marketing so that, you know, you, you, you lay, you have a limited uh, consuming public actually. And who can be the, the higher cost of organic products? That's a reality. 
Okay. Now, shall planting in 2002, and since then, the range is plant, uh, of planting is 500 to 800,000 hectares per year, except Region 7. Okay. And it is planted by why the higher rate of adoption. Number one reason that farmers are giving is because of the increased yields and incomes. Not only is the yield increased, which is preferred by the feed mills. And if you look at the additional uh, incomes, uh, we have calculated this actually per year of additional income. And this income is, okay, so it makes uh, rural, uh, uh, rural, so how much is the increase in yield? Uh, if you look at, if you can, ma'am, excuse me, po. can you, yes. ma'am, excuse me, po. Pwede pong ma uh, you can turn off your video kasi nag -cha choppy. We're missing some of no, um, which one? Yeah. Yung, which okay, one? Video of po, ikaw, video of lang. Yung video nyo po, kasi choppy which na one? video. Yung inyong uh, 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 profile, paki off yung inyong profile pic. <laughs> sige, sige. Okay, okay. so okay. thank you, po. Okay, now. Apo, sige po, tuloy na. And if you compare it with the uh, percent increase in yield compared with non-GM hybrids it is about and how much increase in income, you know, the less cost due to less Uh, we have had farmers who talk about uh, a net income of 100,000 pesos per hectare per season. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. Sorry about that. Okay, ma'am. Pwede na. Continue po. Okay. So, what is the impact on the economy? This is, uh, you know, from the paper of, uh, of Alvarez et al. that includes... Uh, Abe Manalo and uh, Monching Clarete, the productivity growth of the corn industry is increased by 11.5% due to GM corn adoption. Corn imports decreased by 5.4% and the benefits would accrue to all planters, whether you're a small holder or it is a large land holding. And uh, the impact on the environment, it promotes arthropod biodiversity. This is a study done by the late uh, Dr. Reyes. And GM crops allow farm plant biodiversity. This is a continuing monitoring of the Bureau of Plant Industry. And that GM crops do not become invasive. This is a study done in the European Union. Impact on he human health, farmers are actually healthier they're because they're less exposed to farm chemicals. Actually, <laughs> Brooks and Bar Barfield, uh, ba Barfoot has uh, explained this very well in their paper. And then uh, for consumers, this is, these uh, products, GM crops, are as uh, safe as non-GM foods. The other environmental the benefits that has been... Uh, uh, studied or uh, what's this? The results of the study of Dr. Gonzalez also talks about other environmental impacts. Uh, it increases land use efficiency. You need 15% less land to produce one metric ton of uh, GM corn compared with non GM corn. Okay. And this would prevent, of course, the conversion of virgin land to agriculture. Okay. So you have higher land use efficiency. You also have higher fertilizer use efficiency. Okay, uh, GM corn farmers uh, claim that uh, the the corn has nine percent more is more efficient in using uh, fertilizer than non GM corn. Okay, and this would uh, impact on the it would mean reduction in carbon emission because you use less fertilizer. Labor use is also more efficient with GM corn compared with non-GM corn, okay? So, and then uh, you also have a higher efficiency of pesticide use. So, env the environmental impact in the Philippines would, okay, just to summarize that, 
you have a higher land use efficiency, higher fertilizer use efficiency, higher labor use efficiency, and, pesti and higher pesticide use efficiency when you plant GM corn. On the other hand, let us talk about, you know, whether you can plant together in a general area, GM corn or GM crops, and you can practice organic farming. What we are saying here is that in the same general area, town or province, you can have both organic agriculture and GM crop production. And uh, this can be done by designating certain areas as exclusive agriculture area. And this should be in collaboration with farm owners. Okay. The farm owners should agree. So it would be very difficult actually when you start um, declaring a particular area as uh, organic when uh, the farmers themselves would not agree. For example, this is an example of how uh, different crops of different system, production system can coexist in a general area here. Um, this is your organic banana in here. You have your conventionally growing coconut here. And this is your uh, GM corn, uh, GM rice, okay? So you can, in a general area like this, you can uh, grow them side by side. And the reason for that, of course, is that since these are different species, there will be no uh, cross-pollination because cross-pollination is actually the, high, the risk in organic farming. And th there has been cases in the EU and in the US about uh, cross-pollination between GM variety and non-GM variety, especially uh, with the, the non-GM variety being uh, produced as an organic product, okay? But we have to remember that cross-pollination, of course, happens only within the same species or closely related species. So like the picture that I have shown, you have banana and, and, uh, and rice and uh, coconut, they have no means, uh, there's no possibility of cross-pollination among those three crops, so you can grow them together. And cross-pollination among, uh, among varieties of the same species depends on the distance between the farms, and whether the species is cross-pollinated or self-pollinated and the use of common harvesting and post-harvest equipment and also the level of intrusion. Now, in agriculture, especially in the production of, uh, of uh, registered seeds, we have practices that would prevent the cross-pollination you know, of, uh, of varieties, to maintain the purity of the seed, the foundation, the breeder of the registered seeds. One way is to plant these uh, varieties at different times. One is to plant a tall, thick heads between the two fields. You can also use nets to prevent insect pollinators, or you can plant them away from each other. If you have a cross-pollinating species, the distance would be between 200 to 500 meters between the two varieties. But for self-pollinating species, this can only 10 meters, okay? So that's for rice. For the cross-pollinating species, you have your corn. Just to show you what we mean by hedgerow protection from cross-pollination here. So you have hedgerows here. And also netting would prevent cross-pollination. And just to show you the data about, uh, you know, that uh, whole countries can produce both GM crops and organic agriculture at the same time. And uh, what we have here is data on the uh, countries that are planting the most uh, GM crops as well as producing organic uh, food crops. Okay. So you have Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, India, Mexico, USA, Uruguay. These are also the both the highest producing, uh, you know, the, the countries producing the uh, most GM crops as well as organic food crops. So thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you very much, Dr. Halos. Uh, we have seen how uh, genome, uh, genome modification or genetic modification has uh, provided the global community the benefits of the products from um, in the last 25 years. A lot um, close. <laughs> We're getting close to 30 years already that we're enjoying the benefits and that these benefits can still be enhanced if our farmers will use uh, these seeds, seeds of uh, genetic modif modified products in, uh, uh, in coexistence with uh, organic or using agriculture, organic agricultural practice. Thank you so much. Let's now proceed with uh, the next set of poll questions. Can we have the poll questions, please? Okay, so these are the poll questions for Dr. Halos' uh, presentation. So it's uh, number one is organic farming is principally required to ensure safety of the produce. Biotech crops are regulated to determine the production system <laughs> are strictly followed. Um, Organic agriculture is mainly anchored on the principles of health, ecology, fairness, and care. And the standards and certification processes for organic agriculture should conform with the standards and procedures of which organization. Let me see if you have really heard uh, the talk or the presentation of Dr. Halos as you respond to these poll questions, please. And then uh, we'll see the results in a little while. So for those who have already answered, let me invite you to please post your questions of the Q&A box. We have a number of questions for Dr. Uh, for Ms. Agbagala. Let's now, uh, you can now post your questions to Dr. Halos and we will proceed to it's the close. in a little while. What is it, sir? <laughs> Allah baliktad. <laughs> they did not understand my <laughs> presentation. Okay, meron na po pala tayong results? Uh, yeah. Can we show, can we see the results, please? I don't know, pala. I, have a, I don't see it, pala. It's a lot of I was looking. Okay, so that means we still have a lot of uh, discussion to do <laughs> with this. Uh, number one is false. Number two is false. Okay. Yeah. Balik tan sila. Eh. False. False. Number three is true. Okay. Number three. Uh, wait. And number three. What is number three? Yes, true. Yeah, okay. true. And okay. number four is? I follow um, uh, Where is I follow um, yeah. there? Movement. This okay. one, agricultural movement. National Federation. Yeah. Okay, so that's, let's see how we are going to fare with the Q&A. We still have a lot <laughs> of understanding to do. Thank you so much. Can we now uh, have the, the spotlight for Ms. Agbagala, Dr. Halos, and myself? As we look at the questions in the Q and A box, okay, mom. Let's see if your Wi-Fi is already working. So, uh, first, I would like to respond to the questions, the poll questions of uh, for the for Miss Agbagala. There were some questions which were also not rightly responded to. <laughs> So uh, first would be DA, the second question, is DA the lead agency responsible in the conduct of public consultation related to biotech products? The correct answer is DILG, yeah, it's yes. not DA. And I think uh, the fourth question is socioeconomic considerations in decision-making on GMOs is a mandatory requirement under the Cartagena protocol and by safety, the answer is false. No. Yeah, okay. And we have also, we have already responded to the poll questions for, for Dr. Halas. Now let's see the, the questions posted at the Q&A box. And um, so there were several by anonymous attendee. I don't know why he doesn't want to be uh, recognized. <laughs> so is there available 
milled golden rice in the market or producer of golden rice and other GM crops, BD corn and BD eggplant approved for consumption, specifically in Zamboanga Peninsula area. And I think these are, you can answer this uh, uh, consecutively. Are GM products of Gilecone safe to eat by humans? And how do we address ukai seeds in, uh, uh, in the Philippines? And uh, how are harvested GMO grains and fruits during the laboratory and field trials disposed if they are not allowed to be eaten? Yeah. Those are the questions for Ms. Agbagala. Amalu, okay. can you respond to those? Thank okay. you. So for number one, is there available milk golden rice in the market in, 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 in Sambuanga or, or other GM crops? Well, for GM, for BT corn, if Sambuanga has no GMO ban policy, then I'm sure that BT corn products or GM food are already um, available in Sambuanga. But for G golden rice and for BT eggplant, uh, it's not yet available for, for commercial because of, I think for golden rice, they're just now um, doing uh, production, seed production. And with, uh, with the eggplant, well, it's now um, it's the, the assessment and evaluation for its application for commercial cultivation has been finished. And it's now awaiting the approval of the VPI director. And then for the question, are GM products of yellow corn safe to eat by humans? Well, uh, there are actually 100 studies uh, globally to prove the safety of GM crops and its products. And the safety of GMOs has been affirmed by agricultural and food safety regulatory agencies around the world, including our own regulatory agencies. And this has actually undergone rigorous safety assessment for food, feed, and for environment. How do we address the okay BT corn seed that farmers use? Well, unfortunately, our buy safety regulation for GM crops does not cover does not cover the okay seeds. But I'm sure the regulatory agencies, the, the, the concerned regulatory agencies have been have been made aware of these issues, of this concern, and they are now trying to address this issue. So how are the harvested GMO grains and fruits during the laboratory and field trials disposed if they are not allowed to be eaten? Well, for, um, for like, for example, for BT corn and BT eggplant, uh, we, have the, we have them chopped into pieces and then boiled inside the trial site and then uh, buried also in the trial site. And then in addition for golden rice, for rice, we have the plants uh, plow under. And then we have this uh, one or two months uh, post-volunteer monitoring period to make sure that there are no volunteer, volunteer uh, seeds that would remain in the field trial site. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think you have covered most yes. all of it. Thank you so much. Maybe okay. there will be more questions coming up in a little while. For Dr. Halos, ma'am, you can show your uh, video. You can turn on your video. <laughs> Let me see. Okay. Existence. Areas for organic and for GM are determined in one local or province. Will this also cover using GM in organic farms or will it just be about zoning? So, yeah, well, the law says uh, when you do organic farming, you cannot use GMOs. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's in the law. Uh, if you want to ch change that, you have to go to Congress to have it changed. So you cannot uh, use GM in organic farms and <clears throat> yeah zoning is the uh, solution to you know not because you see when you go into organic farming you have to see to it that the land has not been used for for conventional farming okay it is not allowed that's why you have a conversion period of at least two years mm -hmm. so so it's it's uh, zoning is the only way that you can have coexistence within a province or within a town or even within a barangay. Okay, thank you. And then this is for a question from uh, our colleague from Thailand. How do you prevent some inputs, fertilizer and pesticide leak to organic farms nearby? How, how Actually, you... this could be a question between the neighboring between neighboring farms. Mm -hmm. where they can talk about how they can prevent the leak leakage. Um, it has to be, you know, uh, 
one farm has to be uh, on top of the other, meaning that your organic farm should be above the inorganic, the conventional farm, if mm -hmm. that's possible. The other, of course, is how you can uh, ensure that the water from one farm will not get into the other. Yeah, that's yeah. how uh, there should be a planning on uh, farming in Azul. Yeah, and also neighboring farms should talk together about this because this is how they do it in this is how they do it in Chile. You know, uh, they 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 have a very good system there of uh, what's this of farmers helping farmers follow their own production systems. So this is actually, you know, you don't get government involved in this one. It's between neighbors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's essential. Okay, uh, while we were waiting for our questions a while ago, uh, Ryan already responded to a question by Jan Apiku. This is, what is the yield potential of the golden rice in comparison to other varieties? And Ryan responded, we likely have someone else who can answer more in depth. <laughs> Yes, this uh, we don't have uh, the person here, but uh, golden rice had to be shown to have no reduction in yields. This is made sure by our researchers from Field Rice and Erie. And uh, we will post uh, this uh, link which Ryan provided in his response to John Apiko. So what yeah, let me just okay, add yes, Ola, that you yes, know, that is one of the one of the first the issues in the first uh, GM, or the first golden rice that uh, they had, you know, it, it affected uh, the yield. So they have to come up with a different uh, transformation event. And the, so this, the new transformation event did not show any difference in the yields between the golden rice and the parental variety. So, you know, you don't worry about yields between the golden rice and its parental variety. Yeah. Okay. We have one question here from uh, Daniel Edina. Which is more efficient in GM crop production? Is it organic or inorganic farming? I don't know <laughs> if there has been any research on this yet. So compare okay. <laughs> okay. Let me again reiterate that if you are into organic farming, organic agriculture, you cannot use GM varieties. Okay. But if you are into GM crop farming and you use organic inputs, mm -hmm. it's even better for the soil. For example, this, uh, this uh, farmer in Tarlac who used, well, he used, of course, uh, other, let's say, inorganic fertilizer, and then he added organic fertilizer, and he came up with the 17 tons per hectare, okay? So, so for organic, for, for GM crop farming, you have more leeway, you have more uh, choices in the production, in the uh, inputs that you use yes. compared with organic farming. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay, so we, uh, we're still waiting for some questions. So maybe I would like to ask Dr. Halos to, to again reiterate what uh, why our uh, audience responded wrongly to the question. <laughs> so the first thing is, organic what? farming is principally, is this the one regulated to ensure safety of the produce? The answer is false, but many of you guys answered true. So what is the, how are you going to expound this again, ma'am? <laughs> well, actually, if you look at the production standards, okay, in certification of your organic produce, you have to follow the Philippine national standards for organic agriculture. And the standards set production, is, you know, ways of production, actually, methods of producing organic product. It does not talk about uh, whether you have to test it so that it's going to be safe, you know. For example, uh, there was a time when we were using organic uh, fertilizer from uh, from waste of urban of, from urban waste. Mm -hmm. Now you know in urban waste there are heavy metals there. Okay, for example, if you prepare uh, in in the in the processing of films, you know, uh, high, high heavy metals are used there. You know, mm -hmm. so. It is, uh, we did not set standards for that. We do not, you know, we have organic uh, 
like uh, fertilizer, but we don't do not set standards for safety. Even in the in the uh, national standards for organic agriculture, there are no standards for safety. Unlike in as explained by Ms. Malo, there are standards for safety for GM crops. So that's a bi very big difference in regulation. Okay. Yeah. And we keep on claiming that organic produce is safer. Now, I don't know. Nobody has tested that. But for GM crops, we can assure you that it is safe because the regulatory uh, system ensures the safety of GM crops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And then, um, any more questions from the audience? Okay. Okay. There's one here. Uh, is is it possible to have coexistence between organic livestock farms? Oh, this is for livestock. If most of the available feed ingredients locally produced or imported were from GM crops, I don't think uh, we have uh, coexistence in live organic livestock. What do you think, Mom? No. Yeah, these standards there actually would would like to see. Actually, when when uh, you know the standards were uh, drafted. This is a question that, that uh, the regulators has uh, really looked into very well. And uh, somehow they were able to, they accepted that uh, since what is available are, you know, GM, GM uh, ingredients for feed, uh, somehow they were able, they, they accepted that actually. Because what it means is to, you know, that's why we were, uh, the Department of Agriculture is proposing to, establish uh, organic uh, organic agriculture hubs wherein in those hubs you produce all the inputs that you need to be able to fully claim that you are organic which means that if you need gm corn you uh, you need corn you have to produce non gm corn in that hub if you need soybean again you have to produce your own gm soybean in that hub uh, that is the ideal that uh, they are proposing. So, uh, you know, I think, um, yeah, that's part of the organic agriculture program. And and if we were if we are able to set that up, then we say that we can really be like even the seeds that you produce, they have the, to be produced organically. Okay, <laughs> you cannot choose G, uh, seeds uh, you, that you buy from. Uh, from uh, conventionally producing farm. It has to be organic also. So everything has to be organic. And this is also one of the difficulties actually with our organic uh, agriculture system because uh, we do we need all this uh, support, uh, supporting uh, activities such that you can fully claim that you are organic. Uh, right now, it's very difficult to produce organic livestock. But they do produce what's that organic chicken, because chicken you can uh, it can be free range and you feed them only with ordinary rice. Mm -hmm. That's the traditional way that we are producing our chicken, free range chicken, and therefore you can claim that fully organic. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that explains it all. Uh, let's move uh, forward with uh, some other questions. Uh, can we have questions for? Uh, Ms. Agbagala, I have one. Uh, when we are, uh, we're looking at the Philippine regulation, so what is next? We already have the JDC one already revised. We have already the NBT approved. And so we're just waiting for the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Are we waiting for the animal biotech perhaps? Yes, uh, for the um, regulatory framework for GM animals, this was actually the second draft of the of the framework was actually submitted and uh, discussed uh, at the uh, NCBP meeting last January that last June eighth of twenty twenty two, and uh, we are just actually polishing up some issues like uh, we are actually just getting some comments from the different biosafety committees and then after that that it would actually be uh, maybe we can uh, we can. Uh, already subject the the framework for stakeholders consultation and then for the uh, guidance the guidance document for gm fish it's now undergoing review by the funding agency 
And so after that, I understand it will be submitted to the, the National Committee on Bi Safety of the Philippines also for its review and for its assessment. Wow. How so we have two, the GM uh, like framework for GM animals and then for uh, GM, GM fish. Wow, yes. We're not really far, far behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We're just... Uh... Uh, it's very new, good that uh, all our scientists are really, are really helping the regulators to understand what's going on. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, let's look at the next question, which is uh, from Miguel Pedroso. With increasing cost of inputs, then it is better to go organic and GM instead of hybrids that require large external inputs. What do you say about this, Mam <laughs> Dr. Halos, you're mute. Sorry. Okay. Um, we really have to study this very well. Actually, uh, our uh, productivity has decreased in the last quarter because of the very high cost of fertilizer. They, the cost has tripled, uh, quadrupled, actually. It's, it's very, a very big problem. But biotechnology has a solution for this, you know. We have not really promoted or appreciated the impact of biofertilizers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. seed inoculants that increases the ability of the plant to, um, to absorb more min mineral nutrients from the soil, use uh, fertilizer in a more efficient way. And also, in, in some cases, you have this free living and... Uh, symbiotic nitrogen fixers. We have not really looked into this, uh, these inputs actually. And I think it is an opportunity for us to, to show farmers, uh, to, to, for the far farmers to be able to appreciate these kinds of inputs. And they're very cheap to produce actually. Um, it's not necessarily organic farming that is the solution because you see, if you use only organic fertilizer, you're not going to use, uh, you're not going to produce as much. That's our problem also, because if you look at the farming that we have been doing, you know, mm -hmm. our farmers have not, not used as much fertilizer as other countries, as other, as other farmers in other countries do. So mm -hmm. basically our soils are depleted of uh, nutrients. And this uh, depletion cannot be filled up actually by organic fertilizer. Okay. It's not enough. Okay, I hope that so that's our problem. So, actually. Yeah. One of the questions in, in the uh, Q&A. Now, I'm very interested with the insect-resistant sugarcane uh, developed by Brazil, and it's now being planted for two years now in Brazil. Uh, for, for a question for Ms. Ba uh, Malu, have you received any application for import yet for that, for planting in the Philippines? Not yet. Oh, I hope we would have that because uh, we have a problem in, because Tegros is, we know, is, uh, is where sugarcane is planted. And uh, Mamhalos, how can we, um, uh, I mean, what's the situation in, in Negros? Would be, would GM be, Planted here, it's such as GM sugarcane. Uh, it's very useful. It's very beneficial for our farmers so that they won't need to in, uh, apply uh, insecticides. Is this possible, perhaps, in Negros? Uh, well, uh, right now, uh, Negros has an or ordinance against the planting of GM crops. Okay. Okay. So readily, they cannot uh, avail of any improvements in GM uh, sugar in in, of GM sugarcane, actually, and I am not sure about actually the problem with let me see sugarcane has the highest use of fertilizers actually, I think, and uh, I think the other problem there is more about drought, so drought resistant uh, drought tolerance would be a more valuable trait. Uh, we have to talk with our sugar planters actually to come up to find out what is their major uh, technical problem that uh, biotech can offer a solution for. Okay. But as of today, if there is a, one available, they cannot avail of it because they have an ordinance against planting GM crops. Yeah. Uh, I'm still waiting for questions. We still have a few more minutes. And uh, 
any other questions from uh, the floor? Others? Oh, okay. I thought there was one raised hand. Uh, okay, now, so let's move forward and maybe uh, for uh, the last few minutes, can we ask uh, our two speakers to give the, their uh, key messages um, with regards to what's going on and how can the Philippines be more um, responsive, responsive and responsible for our farmers and our consumers? Any last thoughts? Uh, let's start with Malu. You're mute, ma'am. <laughs> okay. So uh, actually we have, for 31 years, we have our regulatory biosafety system uh, and the country showed that uh, it has actually, we have shown the overall success of the system in safeguarding and uh, uh, and safeguarding the people and the environment against the perceived effects of the processes and the procedure and products of modern biotechnology. And I think it showed the responsiveness already, the responsiveness and the flexibility of our system and the capabilities of the regulatory agencies uh, in doing science-based decisions or in making science-based decisions to overcome the difficulties that we have actually encountered during the, the years past. So the, what I can say is that the dynamism of the Philippine biosafety uh, system has been demonstrated in continuously looking out for beneficial new biotechnologies and formulating uh, suitable biosafety guidelines for such technologies, for such emerging technologies. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for our regulators. Now uh, let's hear from Dr. Halos. Actually, uh, um, we can have both organic agriculture and GM crop farming. Actually, you know, it all depends on the market opportunities. If we have a higher opportunity for marketing organic products, why not? Because what we want to do is for farmers to be able to earn more. You see, uh, poverty in the farming and fishing sector is the highest among the various sectors in the economy. And this also make, make them the mo most food insecure. See, we talk about food security, the most food insecure are the food producers. Okay, so we have to have a solution for that. And uh, increasing, you know, increasing productivity will also help ensure our food security. So, you know, uh, we have to have increased productivity increased incomes for our farmers. You can have those for increased productivity and incomes, you know, GM crops. For GM corn has already uh, demonstrated that you can achieve both in planting GM corn because the market is very stable. Mm -hmm. And especially now, you know, uh, the Ukraine war has affected the supply of corn in the world market. Mm -hmm. And that should be an opportunity that we should take advantage of. On the other hand, mm -hmm. there are markets that, that would like organic product if our farmers can produce, you know, for that market and, uh, and have higher incomes, then we should also support that effort. Okay. So thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Let's give a big round of applause, a virtual one, to our uh, speakers. So at this point, I would like to invite our participants to respond to the post-webinar survey. This will now be posted at the chat box. Thank you so much. Uh, this seminar is another eye-opener, as we know, for our stakeholders who want to understand how our biosafety system works. The Philippines sets the biosafety standards in Asia, which is being followed by our neighboring countries. The presentations of Ms. Agbagala also highlighted the stepwise approval process with the golden rice and BT eggplant as case studies. With the increase in crops and traits developed through biotechnology, ad adoption can be increased if farmers are informed that coexistence can be conducted Dr. Hollis provided the differences between organic agriculture and GM technology, and also gave us measures to protect the products of GM technology and at the same time, preserve the integrity of the organic practice. Thank you very much for our, to our experts for these excellent presentations. 
and the attendees for your active participation. Now may I introduce Dr. Claro Mingala, who will give the closing comments. He is the director of the Department of Agriculture Biotech Program Office and the deputy director, executive director of Philippine Carabao Center and the chair of the technical working group of the drafting of the Joint Department Circular for GM Animals and Animal Products Rules and Regulations. Dr. Mengala, please. Hello, good up, good morning to everyone. Uh, greetings from Los Banos. <laughs> I'm here in Los Banos now while monitoring about the seminar. Uh, we would like to thank and congratulate ISAA and the Be Safe Project team for organizing this very timely webinar on the practice of coexistence of biotechnology with organic agriculture, of course, in pursuit of addressing various food production constraints to achieve food availability and security. The coexistence of GM crops and organic farming has been one of the centers of debates globally, not only here in the Philippines. Like any approach, there will always be risks and trade-offs and coexistence may be still at its infancy. However, we can learn from the success of other countries like Chile, where both organic farmers and producers of GM seeds are effectively coexisting. Their approach is anchored on food security, providing farmer options, fair market access, and of course, respect of consumer preferences. These are also among the goals of the Philippine agriculture sector. I would like to, sh to share a perspective from the book Tomorrow's Table by Pamela Ronald and Raul Adamchak, the role of both genetic engineering and organic farming or organic agriculture is to help feed the growing population in an eco ecologically balanced manner. Genetic engineering is not the panacea to solve poverty any more than organic farming is. Yet, it is a valuable tool to address various agricultural issues. The sector needs our collective help and all appropriate tools, those that are good for the environment and farmers and consumers. Our sincere gratitude to our speakers, of course, uh, our forever supportive uh, uh, partner in the, in the OS team is Malu Agbagala. And of course, our advisor, uh, Dr. Saturni Nahalos, for elucidating the environmental, socioeconomic, and policy aspects of coexistence. We also thank the participants of this webinar, of course. We hope that you learned that coexistence may be challenging but feasible in GM crops and organic agriculture. We, hope, we also hope to see you again in the future parts of this uh, webinar series. May this activity stimulate initiatives and gain support from policymakers, the academe, the research, and the industry to promote the coexistence of GM and organic farming in our country. Thank you very much at mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you very much to all the participants. Uh, I hope you have responded to our um, webinar survey. This will improve a lot. Our next webinar, which is scheduled sometime in August or September with another topic, with a very interesting topic as well. 